Welcome to Tulsa Titans, highlighting local leaders who are making a difference. Today I'm with Leslie Neal. How are you doing, Leslie? Hey, Caroline. I'm good. How are you? So you're the founder and CEO of Modus. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so like you said, I'm the founder and executive director of Modus, which is a nonprofit here in Tulsa that um, provides innovative transportation solutions uh, for people to access medical and social service appointments. Um, and we also do a lot of education around transportation and travel training. And we also advocate for improving transportation uh, options for Tulsans um, across the board. I don't know that people know what a challenge travel has been. You know, you and I were talking um, off script and you kind of educated me about what the real need is under 18, what the need is for adults to get to appointments. Can you share a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I can speak, you know, more, more about just in Tulsa specifically. Um, we have a really, you know, spread out landscape. So if you don't have a personal vehicle to get around, which most people do have one, then if you don't have that, it's really hard to get um, to everything you need to get to. So, I mean, think about how your life would be different if you didn't have a vehicle to get to your job right now or to get to your educational opportunities that got you to where you are, um, or even just to, to get out of your neighborhood and, and meet someone outside of your neighborhood to have a different support group. Um, you kind of think back at, of all the times that your life would be different if you didn't have those keys to a vehicle. Um, that's what we're trying to really highlight for everyone to understand because for like 20% of Tulsa, that's the reality. They don't have reliable transportation. Um, and we, uh, for young people specifically, as you mentioned, um, there aren't very many options for them when it comes to transportation. So Uber and Lyft are great. They're awesome to have, but if you're not 18, you can't ride with Uber or Lyft. Um, so if resources weren't an issue for a lot of the clients that we serve, then, then the age restrictions would be. So which is why we actually started Modus as a, uh, a youth program. So we started um, in 2017, actually piloted our, our program since it's something that's never been done. It's a completely new model. Um, we're the first in the nation um, to do this. We started piling this at Youth Services of Tulsa, and we served only 13 to 24 year olds uh, when we first started. So we can get really good at what we set out to do. Um, and then just recently um, in, in 2020, we've expanded our mission um, and our scope of services to include all individuals. So now we've been partnering with organizations who serve seniors and um and just really just we're going to be helping people with veteran uh transportation um so so we just know this is a big problem for not just youth but um across the board in tulsa so 20 percent of tulsa that's 80,000 roughly uh about 80,000 people who just who want to succeed in life but they just can't can't access the services that we often take for granted yeah and i appreciate you broke that down for me you know, I, I looked at what you guys do and said, man, that's great. But until I, I understood that people have to get to appointments and these things are available and they just simply can't, or, you know, you and I were talking about, they plan their day out differently than we have to. They prepare hours ahead of time because if they walk or find a bike or whatever it is, we just, we have this luxury and we've overlooked those that don't have it. Right. They, they miss add, it, add two kids to the mix and imagine how how things can just change in your day. If you have to go, you know, plan, plan your whole trip on the bus. It might take two to three hours to get where you're going. But I mean, in, in Tulsa Transit is great. Don't get me wrong. We we actually have another program um, under Modus called Modus Ed, where we educate people um, on how to use existing transit options. We uh, we always educate um, all secondary high school students at TPS. Um, Tulsa Public Schools. Um, we we um, have a program where we go into the schools and teach everyone how to use how to use the bus system too, because it is a, it's a good option to have. It's just that it might not be the the, um, the most effective and feasible um, solution for every scenario. So that's why we exist, and so it's really to help people get to those critical appointments that help them to succeed in life. Yeah, and you guys are being very successful. You said you're ramping so as people are getting shots and, and getting back out, you guys are ramping back up, right? Yeah, so we um, we closed down for a, a brief time um, in, in about a year ago, uh, in March of 2020, we um, temporarily closed our doors and we spent two months working tire tirelessly, tirelessly. I'm gonna have to say that. So we closed the doors in 2020, um, in, in March of 2020, um, along with most businesses. Um, but we spent about two months really working hard on um, 
adapting our, our protocols and making sure that we had the safety measures in place to resume services because we knew that that while everything else is shutting down, people still need to, to access services. Needs aren't going away. Actually, it's the opposite. The needs were were growing in the community and the the services and the um, the opportunities to help people um, to make sure that they succeed was it was diminishing. So um, we spent um, that the two months while we were um, change, you know, updating our protocols, implementing all these new safety uh, measures to make sure our volunteers and our, our clients um, were as safe as possible. We, uh, we also were doing a bunch of needs assessments with the clients um, in different um, social service agencies to understand how needs were changing whenever COVID first hit. Um, it was just I mean, everyone was pivoting, but there was not a lot of data on what was what was happening. What, what do we need to be serving? And that's where we that's where where we started. That's why we started. We we start with the need, and then we build solutions around that. And so um, that was kind of the first step. Uh, we learned that food insecurity um, and housing were the, the top priority at that time, and still is. Uh, so we we pivoted really quickly and started um, working with Meals on Wheels and with Tulsa Public Schools. So with Meals on Wheels, um, our our team actually teamed up with them and they started delivering all the meals to Meals on Wheels clients um, while we were where we were still closed um, temporarily, um, so that we could still have an impact. We all all of our staff, all of our our whole team here. We have to be making a difference. That's what that's what drives us in our lives. That's our motivator. We all um, we believe in what we're doing, and um, and if we're not we, if we're not making you know any impact, then then I feel like the depression from COVID could have been more. Um, so we we uh, we made sure that that was there was still an opportunity to do that. And then with Tulsa Public Schools, we partnered up with them so that we um, there so for for families that couldn't access those. Um, distribution sites for meals and for um, distant learning materials, we started uh, partnering with them to deliver those to, to families who might not be able to get there. Um, yeah. Well, no, I love that. I lo and what you're saying is reaching across the aisle. And I know uh, culturally that's diminished over time, but it's so powerful. So you saw the need and, and, that, and assessed all the problems and then worked with any available resources by reaching across the aisle to fulfill those. Can you talk about the power of kind of reaching across those aisles and, and what the need for that is? Absolutely, great question. I love talking about this because I'm, I'm all about collaboration. And at MODIS, we're so fortunate to get to be partners with so many different incredible agencies that are just, doing great work. Um, so what we do, we, we partner directly with social service agencies and medical facilities who then um, they will refer their clients who, um, who they identify with to have transportation barriers. They would refer them to us and then we get them set up and have a volunteer, we'll, we'll match them with a volunteer who can provide the ride for, for that person. Sometimes it's not, we might be taking someone to counseling, sometimes job training, um, sometimes it might be higher education. Um, um, what, uh, what else? We'll see. Medical, a lot of clinic visits, medical visits. Um, we, we really, we don't, we don't restrict any kind of service that we, we provide. If the agencies are telling us that, that there's a need and this person needs help getting there, then they know their clients better than we could, right? Whenever we, before we meet them. So, um, so we, we rely on them to tell us what, what they need for their clients so that they can be more impactful in the community. And um, so we've, um, since 20, 2018, after we finished the pilot at Youth Services, um, we've served over, I think, over 30 agencies um, to help with um, client transportation, and our, our partner list is, is continuing to grow. Um, and um, yeah, so, so, it's, so a lot of times there might be duplicative services, uh, um, but MODIS doesn't have that. We, we really, we lead by asking how we can help. And that's all we're here for. We want to make sure that that all those other great you know nonprofits in town, which we have, Tulsa is incredible for that. We have so many cool services, and we're so philanthropic. Um, so we didn't need to make another another agency that was doing what others are already doing. We want to just make sure that they're uh, they're able to help as many people as they possibly can, and that they get to focus on their mission. And we just want to help help increase that. So by by being able to to kind of have a win win on both sides, we get to be so collaborative um, with all of our community partners, and and 
I just, I, I love it. I love the diversity of, of what challenges we face every day, um, of trying to find solutions for the different different issues that other um, different different types of industries within the nonprofit world are facing. Um, and really just getting to, to, to think through things and work with all the, the super intelligent and inspiring leaders that we have in our community. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor to get to do that in my, my day-to-day role. Well, that's awesome. And to take the time, you know, I've visited with a lot of our non-for-profits and I, I hate to compare um, some of the local companies to some of the leaders in the non-for-profits, but man, they have passion and, and desire. And I, I think it boils down to, and you and I were talking about this, they have a mission that they believe in every single day and they have core values they run by. And, and so I want to jump into this because a lot of your success comes from reaching across the aisle. It also comes from volunteers. And so you actually get to motivate every single day on top of everything else you're doing, people that don't get paid. How do you do it? Luckily, I don't have to, to do it completely because if it's all reliant on me, then it's not going to work. Um, we're at a point now that all the volunteers they all have their own reasons for volunteering with us. And I, I love to, to be at a point now where I get to sit down and I get to hear why each person really comes in the door and what their experiences are. And, and they teach me so much. So I used to have kind of a, uh, what I thought people would want to volunteer for Modus with, like, here's here's my pitch of what, what you'll get out of it. But honestly, um, that was limiting. That was only what I thought. And once uh, we once we started, you know, really, getting our, our, our legs and, and really um, started growing. And we had the, uh, the, um, the volunteers, our, our pool of volunteers really grow. That's whenever we had, you know, just the opportunity to, to see um, what everyone's really wanting to do here. So everyone, I mean, everyone has something different. They might not be doing it because they're, they have a family member who's experienced um, similar transportation barriers before, and they've seen what effects it makes on someone's life. Um, others might be doing it because it's such a flexible opportunity to volunteer with. Like, so, I mean, they can take 15 minutes of their day and, and make sure that someone gets to the services that they're needing to get to. And, and they have the, the rapport that people get in the cars. It's, it's so it's so interesting to to, to get to witness. I, um, I mean, you have a seven year old son. We were talking about that earlier, and you think about when you pick him up from school. That's whenever some of that bonding is. That's you know that that short little ride. You get to hear about their day. You get to to kind of just just be there with people, and and that kind of support is is what makes it go makes Modus really work. Um, if if I was having to just motivate everyone all the time. The, this model doesn't work. The, the the beautiful thing about Modus is that we have volunteers on both sides. We have clients, are, it's a voluntary uh, voluntary decision to ride with Modus and to use Modus as services. So they don't have to. And then with volunteers, it's absolutely voluntary. Uh, they, they don't have to take time out of their day at all. They're, it's not mandatory. So um, so it's it, it speaks very highly of, of what, what the experience is um, and, and people are um, are choosing to to support each other, and it just makes it, it, the beauty about Modus is that it's uh, community members helping community, and um, and that's that's what I want this to grow to, and that's what I'm seeing it grow to every every day. I get to see a new thing where it's it, they might not be coming in because of me now; it's because of the mission, and and others are very passionate about this too. And so, Leslie, you talked about really diving into the year. What I like is you guys took advantage of the season that you were down with COVID to, to write new processes and to really look at what the need was and you reached across the aisle. Now that it's ramping back up, not only do you have all the new processes, you have all these, that ramp season that just kind of seems overwhelming. So as a professional, what do you do? One or two things you know daily that, that helps you to kind of stay on top of those things? So I am a list maker. I like to know what I'm doing. I'm a planner, a project manager, call it whatever you want. Um, I, I, I have to plan. Um, but that being said, it's really easy for that, that to-do list to just never end. I mean, if, if, if I didn't break it up to a way that was actually something that I can manage, I'd be, I'd be at work 24 seven. And that's what I was doing when I first started it. And it's probably what, it, what Modus needed when I first started it is that it needed that much, you know, attention and, and it's still, you know, we're still growing and um, there's still so much to do and we have a small team right now. Um, 
so we all wear a lot of hats and we, and we have to manage so many different things. But um, I always, uh, every day at the end of my day, I always take about 10 minutes to just write out my my things that I have to get done the next day and then the things that, that could wait for another day. So there's only about like five or six um, things I always add to, things I absolutely have to get done the next day. And once I get those things done, then if I have extra time, then great. I'll, I'll work on the other things that can get done another day. Otherwise, if it's if it's 6.30 at night and I'm, I'm finished with everything I had to get done, I'm heading out of the office, which is something I've, I've learned about myself. It's that I have to force myself to actually to leave because if you're if, being so passionate about, about our mission is, is something that every executive director is going to have about their organization. But it, there's kind of a, a slippery slope there of, of becoming what I was turning into as a workaholic. So making sure that I'm, I'm, I'm self-aware of that and I have um, steps to make sure that I'm taking care of myself is really important because if I'm not taking care of myself, then I'm not bringing the best to my team and, you know, it, it, the the list will go on of what will the consequences will be if 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 I'm not taking care of that and you know in the burnout as well so it's just trying to manage that um, and and not get overwhelmed is, is always important um, so that and then also something I don't do every day but I would say um, on a weekly basis I make sure that I always. Um, check in or have some coffee uh, with my mentors. I have some great mentors in Tulsa, um, people who have a lot more experience than I do. And as we always wanna think that every every scenario, that, that it's a unique scenario that no one's ever experienced, right? But the truth is like, in, if you surround yourself with people who are smarter and have more experience than you, you're gonna just you're gonna be able to bounce ideas off of people. So I um, I make sure to to ask questions and and really lean on my mentors for advice. And and throughout COVID, I've done that. Even whenever you know I, I, we found ways to make sure that it was still safe to do that. And I feel like that's that's a really important thing. So I have my, my daily my daily habits, but I'd also say my weekly habits that um, are just things that I would say that that help me in my with my self-care and personal life, as well as managing everything at work. Well, that's so well said. I want to go back to the first one for a second, because it's really important. You know, with Tulsa Titans, one of the things that we want to do is continually, you and I were talking about mind gold. You know, when we, we get to a certain season in our life, we look back and say, man, if I just knew that when, and a lot of young professionals deal with burnout. They deal with feeling like if I put more hours in, I get more out and they sacrifice life for work. And then they do eventually burn out and they, they don't have any clarity on the fact. And I, I went through the same thing that I'm so exhausted. I'm not giving a hundred percent when I am present and ready to work. Right. So what are a couple of the, the boundaries that you put in place to be able to disconnect and leave the office? Well, I'm still working on that myself, to be honest. Um, I think COVID really highlighted um, just the, the need to, to prioritize health care. I know it's been something, I mean, there that's it's a, it's a class subject now in in most universities is self care um, and it's so important and we we kind of get, get that drilled in our heads but then we don't know how to practice it as much because like you said we're young professionals where we get out we want you know we want to prove ourselves and and so we kind of throw all that out thinking that that that's not really essential but it absolutely is um, I I would say like I make sure that I um, I'm a big nature person, so I I make sure that I always get outside for at least a few hours once a week, or if I can break it up throughout the week, then that's great too. But I I've just learned things that like I know that that I need to make sure that um, that I'm I'm healthy and I'm, I'm and I'm happy. You know, I need sunlight. I need you know just just fresh air. Um, those kind of things like we can't sacrifice that stuff. And work will always be there. Um, I think, you know, we, I also thought whenever I, you know, was starting Modus that I had to lead by example and by leading by example, I had to work nonstop so that, that everyone thought I was pulling my weight. And, um, and that's a, that's a, a personal mental thing that, that I have going on. And I think, but I think a lot of leaders can relate to that. Um, but the truth is the best way to lead by example is taking care of yourself and making sure that that's a priority too, so that others are seeing that and you're not trying to make sure everyone else is staying there until 9 p.m. every day. 
Oh, absolutely. I actually, through a season, I work out like five o'clock in the morning now that I have kids. It just gives more time with travel and I talk too much when I'm at the gym, right? But but the gym for me, it's it's a physically healthy thing, but the wheel spins so fast with all that to-do list, even though we wrote it down in the next big project and the five employee deal, or whatever you have on your mind, um, it's, it's a really healthy way for me anyway to just clear my mind. Uh, but in a season of overworking, I had to make a, an appointment with a buddy to work out at 430 every afternoon. And I do it for quite a while. And I, it was non-negotiable. I had somebody relying on me to show up. So I had to leave the office. That was the balance I put busy. in place because I got stuck. You're busier and busier. I mean, my if I'm if it's not on my schedule the week before, I'm not going to be able to put it in the schedule. So I just make sure that that there are things that are standing on the schedule that that just don't go away. And so whether you know some of those are we I have coffee with certain people every every other week, um, you know, making it manageable. Um, and sure things are going to come up, but putting things on the schedule for for your own personal care too is just as important of, of filling it all up with business stuff. You know, um, making sure that that they you're holding yourself accountable to, to, to that part. Well, I love part of the schedule is your mentors, like making time for people to pour into you because they've, they've walked the road before they've, they've had people in their life and so many young professionals get stuck in that they have to do it and they need to know it all. And we can't, we just simply can't. So who is one of the mentors you admire and why? That's a really tough question because I am so fortunate to have some incredibly intelligent um, and and talented people um, that I can I can lean on um, and and really big you know real change makers that have have, have had so much experience um, doing that. I'd say a couple of them. Um, well, say David Grew from Youth Services is the executive director over there. Um, he's I, I consider him a good friend. Um, I, he he was uh, where Motos kind of started. He um, helped pilot it in the beginning. So um, when we started Modus in 2017, we were there for about a year, and we didn't there was we didn't have a, a, a script. We didn't really we weren't working off of something that someone else designed. So. Um, you know, talking through that stuff with him was incredibly helpful for me. Um, and we've continued to, to stay in touch. And actually he's on our board of directors now, which that's kind of what that turns into in nonprofits too. You don't want to just pack full of, of, of people that, that you can't lean on like that. The board of directors is people that you want to be your mentors. And that can kind of, that's, that's kind of where I led with, with starting the board of directors with people that I've already, who have already been kind of in that role. Um, and they can have more of a formal position to, to, to do that. Um, another one I would say would be uh, Mike Rose over, he just retired from 20 something years at Mental Health Association as the CEO. Um, and he offers a, such a unique perspective because he always calls himself the chief empowerment officer. So um, he's just so, so fantastic of, of just, um, you know, just engaging people and, and really uh, bringing out people's strengths and empowering people. And so um, it, it's a, a pleasure to see people who have, to, to really get to, to get to learn from people who have different styles than me. But at the end of the day, I mean, a nonprofit is still a business. Um, it's a nonprofit business. Um, so it doesn't have to just be nonprofit in the nonprofit world. I mean, I have, I have a lot of, a lot of people that I um, can lean on outside of that as well, which I think it's always so important to have a very, um, a, a perspectives from across the board. Um, you can't, you know, it, the difficult thing that whenever anyone's getting so involved in one thing, especially when people are starting out at, um, in uh, right out of college or, you know, if they, they just got their first like, you know, full-time big job, um, they sometimes will get tunnel vision because we think that that's their world, right? And it's just really important to make sure you pull back and, and surround yourself with people who just have different perspectives and, continue to ask questions and ask for advice. No one expects anyone to know everything. And I think that's something that people sometimes put pressure on themselves that they have to figure everything out, but it's, it's not the case. We're continually growing and learning. And so we, uh, for me, one of the best sources for that is, is, is people. People are a wealth of knowledge that we should always be relying on. No, I love that and I agree. And our board, you know, it took me a while to figure this out. Um, we have people that were all different. Nobody's the same. Nobody thinks the same. And I have some mentors of mine that are much quieter. I'm kind of a loud person 
and I, I see a problem and I like to try to attack it, they, they think a little different. They think longer. And because I have respect for them, they give me insights of, of cliffs that I'm about to jump off of. I, I embrace failure sometimes a little too fast. And so it's been a, a real blessing, like you said, to not only bring mentors alongside and put them on a board um, for you, but make sure they're different. Mm -hmm. So how are you as a professional now looking at the staff that you have, the volunteers, the values and the things that you're learning? How are you working to instill and distill those throughout the, the organization? So by example, still, you know, I mean, I, I, I believe, you know, in leading by example and that, that kind of was, I was getting at that earlier too, about how that can be challenging. If you think that, you know, it depends on what your perspective is of, of what a leader should look like. Right. So, um, I thought a leader was one thing whenever I first started, and now I'm seeing that it needs to be, a, you know, a holistic, you know, person who can who can relate to the staff, who takes time to to make sure that that you're you're considering staff and not just as 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 employees, but as people. Um, we have a really tight knit group, um, and I think a lot of that's just because we we care about each other. And I think that if you're not being empathetic and thinking. Um, you know, thinking as uh, with your with your teammates as extended members of your family, then it's going to it's going to be hard. I mean, we especially I mean, as hard as we work, um, I spend more time with them sometimes than I do anyone else, especially in COVID. During COVID, I mean, you don't see anybody. Um, so uh, I feel like they were like, you know, a few of the, the only people that I really got to, to be around. Um, but um, what else did you? Well, like to, I'd like to highlight, you know, one of the things I thought you said that was really special was you you continue to try it at first to pitch modus and, and the more that you've really developed and, and the more people sell themselves and the mission that you guys started with is you actively listening and just genuinely spending time not only with people that are looking to volunteer for you, but you spend a lot of time listening to people and really understanding what their purpose and mission are and all the other organizations Tulsa has to offer. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're, if we don't listen, then we're cutting off so much, so, so many opportunities to grow. And, um, and so whenever we started Modus with the volunteers, like you said, the pitch was what I thought people would want to volunteer for. Um, and then as we kept growing, we had more volunteers. And now we have, um, I'm not even the person who recruits the volunteers, you know, directly. And I don't interview everyone. I mean, I'm still very involved in the process. But now that, I'm, you know, as we grow and I'm, you know, taking different responsibilities in the administration side, um, it's, it's important to make sure we touch base with everything. But I, I really attribute it more to the, the staff and um, and building the core values for our organization across the board and making sure everyone um, kind of knows what those are and, and believes in them and lives by them. So we're a talent, um, a strength-based organization. So we, we look for or, um, individuals with different strengths and we look at how it all works um, as a whole group. And we, um, we want to engage people's strengths. If if they're in, if people are engaged and they're doing what they like to do, they're going to do it better. They're going to they're going to enjoy it, and they're going to exude that. And I feel like that really has that's what's been happening. Um, so whenever uh, we just we sat down last year when we were doing our strategic plan, and uh, we finally got to establish our core values, which was not just me writing it down. It's really important not to just do that. You have to have input and um, feedback from everyone because it's not just me anymore. Modus is not just me. It, we're we're a collective group that's um, that really it's, it's in, involves so many different um, community members. So um, it was beautiful to see, and I have to pull it up to tell you. Uh, our values are that we are passionate, we're genuine and inclusive, we're determined and supportive, and we uh, spread positive vibes. And I didn't come, I didn't say all those, so, you know, that was the whole team, you know, together that we decided on those. And to be, to be completely honest, I couldn't be more proud of that because I couldn't have written it better whenever I first started that that's what I wanted to happen. But it was just by, by treating, you know, by showing people how people should be treated that um, everyone just kind of, we, we attracted the similar people um, as in volunteers and client or in uh, staff and they've just been replicating it um, 
in a, in a broader scale. And I feel like if we keep on doing that and doing it well, then we're just going to have such a great community. And we already do, but I just, I love that we, this is an outlet for community members to really support the other community, the rest of the community. Yeah, I think it really is truly something very special what you guys are doing. Uh, I want to leave everybody with one more question. So, you know, being in transportation, let's say you had a car from here to Houston and somebody was gracious enough to spend time to drive you and you could only take a couple books to reread through. Uh, I know we have a bunch of big readers that watch our podcast. What are those books and what did you get out of them? So I am not a big like fiction reader. I like autobiographies. I like, I, I, I would say that my favorite ones there right now would be, these are not autobiographies, but still, um, Change by Design is something I'm, I'm reading two right now at the same time, but I'm liking both of them. Um, Change by Design by Tim Brown. Um, and it's all about design thinking and just changing perspectives to make sure that you're, 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 making the most impact through whatever change that you are trying to design. Um, and then the other one is building a story brand by Donald Miller. So this is all about just creating a, a cohesive story with any marketing or um, um, any, any kind of um, promotional thing that you might be selling, which for us, I mean, recruiting volunteers is, it's a sales thing still. Everything's sales in my opinion. I, I, I don't want to break it down like that, but you you're trying to you're trying to persuade people to to be part of your mission. And so um, this could be helpful for anyone in for profit, nonprofit, and in, in neither of those things. I just feel like it's good to just know that in any 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 industry that you might be in. Now, that's a wonderful book. He's got a business made simple book he just rolled out too. And it, oh. it breaks down business in short seven minute segments of each and every part of the business kind of likes it to an airplane that you need to know. It's, you know, I've read a ton of business books. It's probably the best communicated resource that I've found for anybody starting a business. And so I'd encourage that too, but yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to check that one out too. So if That's somebody, has, I, I read, I pick up too many at the same time. And then I'm like reading them all for six months. Cause I have like, I just can't, I get sidetracked. <laughs> well, I've done the same thing. Then you get excited and people give you four books and you feel obligated. And now you're reading 12 things. Right. Yeah. I had to, I had to create some barriers for that too. It's fun though. It's a fun ride. It's fun oh. figuring it all out. It is. I agree. So if, if somebody has questions about MODIS uh, or wants to volunteer, wants to know more, or they have a question for you, what's the best form of communication? So um, uh, we have a website. It's modustulsa.org. So it's M-O-D-U-S-T-U-L-S-A.org. Um, our volunteer application is on that, um, but all of our, our contact information is there too. Um, and if, if anyone calls the main number that, that's on the website or emails the, the the main email address on there, it'll get to me. Uh, we, like I said, we're not we're not a huge organization yet, so um, that's probably the best way to, to make sure that it gets to me. But I will respond if, if it goes there. Well, everyone, thank you. This is Kellen with New Wave Solutions. I'm one of the partners here. Leslie, genuinely, thank you for giving today. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure, and I hope you yeah. have a great weekend. You too.